Um, our first speaker uh, is comes to us from uh, a, a unique place in Indiana. If I ask anybody in the room, what do Batesville, Indiana, and Arlington, Georgia have in common? Would anybody have a clue? Yes. Arlington, Georgia does not have a casket manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Both cities uh, occupy space in two counties. Uh, it's always been an, an interesting phenomenon to me that when you drive through Arlington, you, you go through one town and two counties. Um, same is true with Batesville, correct? But the other interesting fact is that the, the biggest manufacturer of caskets in the country is headquartered right there in Batesville, Indiana. And the town is only five, 6,000, something along that line. So they have 40% of the market share of caskets in the nation, which is timely considering they had a Halloween parade last night. And, and I bet you there's a bunch of caskets in the Halloween parade. <coughs> a lot. So. Um, it's an interesting community, um, and so Tim Putnam comes to us, Dr. Putnam comes with a, a history of uh, operating a health system there, it's very successful. He's got over 30 years of experience. He's got his MBA from the University of Southern Indiana, and a doctorate in health administration from uh, MUSC, um, and he focused on acute stroke patients in community hospitals. We have some interest in that from an MCG and Augusta University perspective. Uh, he served on uh, the National Rural Health Association's policy boards uh, and continues to uh, teach uh, at Xavier University on healthcare administration and things like that. But the main thing is, is that he's a very practically oriented hospital operator. And uh, with that, I would like to have Tim come forward. And if y'all would, please welcome him. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I, uh, I've got my slide presentation here. Um, yes, uh, Batesville is uh, the world's largest manufacturer of caskets. The one thing I'll tell you about some of this, a lot of the theme of what I'm going to talk about today is, is partnerships so, uh, and, and collaborations and utilizing resources. So what does a hospital have to do with caskets, sort of besides the obvious? Um, well, you've got to, you sometimes you have to tap into what, what knowledge base you have locally. And, and I will tell you, when you've got to get a custom-made casket from Batesville, Indiana to 60 miles outside of Billings, Montana in three days, they're really good at logistics. You cannot just put a stamp on that thing and mail it. They've got to figure out how to put different distribution centers and different places across the country to get that done. The other thing they're very good at at Batesville Casket is epidemiology. They have this knocked out. CDC calls them for what's going on in, in the world of influenza. The folks at Batesville Casket know, know flu A better than anybody I've ever seen because they've got to ramp up production much more rapidly than we do. Their production line is a little bit different. So just so you know, flu A was very bad this year in Australia. Um, they've had three years of neutral flu throughout the country. So they're predicting a, a higher than usual probability of high, high end flu this year. So that's the news from Batesville. Um, but but it, it taught me when I moved to Batesville, tap into whatever the local expertise is. I mean, what do they have What do they have in town that you can make yourself, uh, you can avail of yourself at the hospital? Plus, it, it leads into what I'm talking about here with regard to, to how to develop your board um, and what to do with the board of directors. Now, I'll, I'll, some of this is about the future of healthcare. Some of it's about what your board needs to know and how to develop the board. It's all kind of munched together uh, in this type of thing. But, it, but it's all this part of a theme of what you really need to do to be successful as an organization. I, I'll tell you, engaging the hospital CEO, engaging in the logistics experts at Batesville Casket and the people in epidemiology at Batesville Casket, it started to align that organization with ours a little bit better. And we got some good people from the board that ended up being part of the hospital and the right people as, as, as we started to say, what expertise do you have that we could really learn a little bit more about? So there's there's Batesville Casket as much as well. Uh, a lot of background on our hospital was, was built in 1932. It was a community hospital. You see the slide on the, on the picture on the upper right hand side. Everybody came out in 1932 for the community hospital. It was actually October of 32. So we were three years into or two to three years into the Great Depression when the community came together to build a hospital. This, this really sort of meant a lot. It's, 
it's something that we fall back on a regular basis and tie into that. But we, we've had a, a, a strong history of being there for the community, being the community's hospital. Just a little bit about us, we are a critical access hospital in a pretty small community. Um, we've got a pretty good size, primary and secondary, depending on how you grow, how you draw the market. Net revenue, we've been very successful. The biggest piece from our net revenue standpoint has, has been capturing the market share. Um, people that could, we are within 45 minutes of Cincinnati, Ohio. People could drive from our community and go to Cincinnati, Ohio and, and receive care at, at, at some great institutions. It takes a lot of hard work and gaining the trust of the community to want them to come here. 83% of our revenue is outpatient. We still do inpatient. We have 25 beds and sometimes they're very busy. Um, but a lot of it is outpatient, 160,000 outpatient procedures. I, I tell people that you cannot, we cannot therapeutically do everything that other, every other hospital can do, uh, but diagnostically, from a lab standpoint, from an imaging standpoint, we've got to be as good as anyone else. We absolutely have to, and then we, we make that known. Now the good part about it is from the people we employ in our hospital, we make that known from all of our team members that this is where we are with the labs, this is where we are with imaging. If we can't do it as well as somebody else, we find a partner to do it with. We're not going to subject our, our local patients to anything less than the best standard. We have 20,000 emergency visits. Now, our emergency department is defined, in, we have an urgent care center inside our emergency department that operates 24 seven. So if you've got a, if you've got, if you're there um, at noon, you're going to get a nurse practitioner taking care of you in the, in the urgent care. If you're there at three in the morning, it's going to be the physician that's there. But so our nurse practitioner's not there the whole time. But I would say half of those visits are true emergency visits and half are, are minor care or urgent care type of situation. We still deliver babies, which is always an interesting discussion at critical access hospital. Do we lose money on it? Oh, yes, we do. Um, is it a big thing for the community that we deliver babies there? Oh, yes, it is. Um, great debate in the world of rural health care. One of the things that I'll, I'll tell you is because of my role of chairing the National Rural Health Policy Congress, I talk to hospitals all across the country and their struggles and what they keep open and what they close. Um, this has been a big debate, and I was just on the phone with some of the folks from the National Rural Health Association this week about how to make uh, rural obstetrics care viable, and I there's 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 great debate of whether it can be. Can we keep obstetricians on call 24 seven? Do you have pediatricians or family physicians willing to come into your nursery to be on call? Can you keep anesthesia on call 24 seven for the volume of care? I've got I've got friends of mine that that have 100 deliveries a year, but pay exorbitantly for call for physicians to be there just in case. And the amount of money they lose is, is tremendous. And they've got well-meaning people in the community that have fundraisers and bake sales and car washes and raise $50,000 a year to subsidize their OB unit that loses well over a million. And how do you keep that going? And, and the discussions are very, very different. The discussions about infant and maternal mortality um, are pushing this debate a little bit more. You've seen the numbers in the US rise for infant and maternal mortality in the last last 15 years and one of the one of the things that people are talking about is the absence of obstetric care prenatal care and delivery service in rural areas impacting this but i so so it's becoming a part of the national consciousness but i don't know where this will end and certainly for small community hospitals if you guys have ever looked at your numbers if you're still doing obstetrics care and you've discontinued it you know what i'm talking about here it's, it's really difficult to keep this viable um, but the impact of rural hospitals closing will be units Built those statistics from maternal and, and infant mortality. All right, this one, this one, I'm preaching to the choir here on this, um, but I think it's something that needs to be said. In my opinion, leading a small community hospital is the toughest leadership job out there, and I would be glad to have a debate with someone that thinks that there's something out there that's more difficult. Some of the reasons are, are, are what I've stated. We don't know who our customer is. Is our customer the patient? Is our customer the parent of the patient? The guardian of the patient? Is our customer the physician that admitted the patient? Is our customer the insurance company, Medicare, Medicaid, or who's paying? 
The misalignment between who receives the service and who pays for the service is intense. We can't even tell who that is. Here's news for you, you don't have any employees or your employees don't report to you. They report to the patient first, they report to their profession or their license second, and then they report to their employer. That's the way it is, that's the way it has been, but it's very difficult, and especially from a board standpoint, you get your board to understand, well, how do your employees do this? <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. That employee is taking care of the patient. That employee is, is representing her licensure or certification or, or whatever it is. You're not going to order your physicians to do something and just make it happen. We take everyone, regardless of their ability to pay, um, the media used to love us and they don't anymore. I've heard statements that, that 30 years ago it was nine good articles about healthcare for every one negative and it's almost flipped completely where it's something like seven, seven negative articles about healthcare. A 747 of people die every day because of healthcare mistakes and things like that. Um, and you just, we're not the media darlings. The board is well-meaning but typically do not know healthcare. You may have one or two people on the board of directors that know what healthcare is, but for the most part, they don't. It's highly emotional. No matter what we do, everybody we take care of is mortal. Everybody will eventually die, and it's complex care they're receiving, and sometimes we make mistakes, and our teams are outstanding, but sometimes things don't go well. In a small community, this is exceedingly tough, because I'm still paying for mistakes that our hospital made in the 60s. Grandma went to that hospital and she was in a bad car wreck and she died and I'm never going back to that hospital. And nobody in that hospital is still there from the 60s, but that, that lingers and we have to do that. Emergency preparation, there's nothing like looking at the examples in Orlando and Las Vegas to realize that you are not immune from being prepared for anything, natural or a man-made disaster that could happen. We drill for it, prepare for it in all the times. So there's a lot of money spent on that we don't receive anything for it in return, but we've got to be there to fill that need for the community. Uh, we're sometimes under governmental control when you're governmental district, county, city, uh, parish hospitals. We send our staff into harm's way. Um, one of the things you've learned in my background is I'm, I'm an EMT. I still run for Batesville Fire and EMS. One of the first things they teach you is, is your scene safe? You do not go in if your scene is not safe. And I will tell you, I don't know that I've ever gone into a safe scene yet. Whether it's on the interstate, in the middle of the night, or in someone's home, or a gunshot victim, or any number of things. We do our best to make it safe. It's not necessarily safe. I was, I was working um, in a hospital when HIV first, first came out, and we had to start taking care of these people. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know what was happening, but all of a sudden, healthy young men were dying of this disease. We didn't know how it was contracted. At that point in time, I worked in laser surgery where we were vaporizing the, um, the cancer with, with a laser and all this plume is coming up. We have no idea whether it is. Whether it's bird flu, H5N1, it doesn't matter. We send people into harm's way. Uh, I, I took over a, one of the jobs I had. I ran an air ambulance service. One of the things that if you're working on the air ambulance service, you have what we refer to as a hard landing file. When you split the skids or you have a hard landing, your team all has letters to their family members and disposition of what's going to happen with certain things because the chance of that happening is pretty substantial. We do send people into harm's way on a regular basis and people that have it as a calling. It is different from an accounting firm from that standpoint. Massive regulation from the state, from the federal government, joint commission, and everyone like that. The biggest thing from my standpoint, from a community hospital, is you don't have the resources. These things are all true in, in academic medical centers, but at a community hospital, you don't have the same level of resources that you have in, in major medical centers. And if you fail, your community fails. The failure of a small community hospital, if, if Margaret Berry goes down the tubes, I don't know how long Batesville is going to produce caskets because we don't have quality health care in town. I don't know how long that town is going to be what it once was. And we've seen that with closures across the country. It doesn't happen overnight. People hang on, but the town ends up being slowly degraded. So there's a lot of pressure on this standpoint. 
I don't know whether you guys all realize that, and I'm preaching the choir, and I've just wasted six minutes talking about this, but healthcare is tough. Um, value pledging trustees, the, the, the thing I'll tell you about this, the board members, because it is so tough, if you don't have your board on, ball, and on, on board and supporting what you do, you're not gonna be successful. If they're acting as a watchdog, if they are doing the things that, that you know that are not, or the CEO is going one way and the board wants to go another way, it's just not going to work. You've got to you've got to engage trustees. They've got to understand what they're doing and, and realize what it needs to help. Um, I utilize them as a group of consultants. So I've got real estate people. I've got people that understand logistics. I've got an attorney, a judge, um, banking. Uh, human resources people that are on my board of directors and I figure out what skill set that they have that I can use from a consulting standpoint. And they also are free, so you know, I tap into that <laughs> from that standpoint. They also, and I'll talk about this a little bit, CEO turnover in rural communities is one of the reasons I think we have not moved forward as a field. The average CEO stays there less than three years in most community hospitals. It's tough to get any traction and going. If, if everybody's going to turn over so frequently, how can you make the, the long-term partnerships? The board represents that long-term vision to elected officials, tertiary care centers, um, and different, uh, different organizations. They're also volunteers. They're also long-term in the community. They've been in the community many times generations. So, what they say means a lot more um, than I think a lot of uh, a lot of us in the, the administrative part, where we're just the CEO. Um, maybe haven't been in the community for a couple of generations. Maybe don't have the standing. Um, that's one of the things that I think we have to convince boards that, that they have a specific role in. And they can't speak on every healthcare issue, but there's certain. Every board member has a couple of key issues that they can talk to legislators about, talk to the media about, represent yourself. Um, board of management need to be aligned. This is one thing that I that I really think what our roles are. The staff, in my opinion, has to be focused on the patient in front of them. They have to, all their focus, their entire world is the need of the patient in front of them or the task in front of them. Management's job really is to make sure they have kind of what they need to do their job. You know, are, are we set up right? How long is that vision? It's kind of looking the next week, next month next couple of months, um, the board's job is simple. They have to look forward long term. They just have to make sure the hospital mission is fulfilled and then it goes on forever. That's pretty much what it is. You can, you can, it's important for the board to know what it's like to care for a patient. It's important for a staff member to understand what the board's doing. Um, but, but really, kind of what you look at is where you should spend your time. This will lead into what you spend your time doing at the board meeting. Is the board meeting, is the board really doing at the board meetings their job? There's a lot of other jobs that seem to be more fun than that, but they've got to do that because if they don't do that long-term visionary, making sure the hospital is fulfilling its mission and going on forever, um, they really won't be successful. The big moves require full support. One of the things, whether, whether you partner with the Federal Qualified Health Center, whether you start a rural health clinic, uh, what you do in the world of population health, whether you add swing beds, um, things like that. Those are big moves and you've got to have full support to be successful in them. Just the CEO wanting to do them won't, won't make it happen. One of the things that, that, that I talk about, and, and I'm glad we're here uh, you know, in a room that just was filled with medical students not long ago, is something that's a pipeline. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail later, but. But how do we move from, from a hunter-gatherer society? When we, we, we look for staff, who do we need? We need good physicians, we need good nurses. If you're thinking about filling the job today, you're not planning ahead. We typically are hunter-gatherers. How do we get these people? What we need to move to is an agrarian situation where we've got these folks going to medical school out of, you know, going to a good undergrad program, going to medical school, out of our region and then encouraging them to come back in the semesters and the, in the undergrad program how do we help them become how do we help them get into medical school how do we help them be successful when they're there um, what are we doing about building that that kind of stuff takes a long time 
and you're not going to make that's not going to be successful three months six months a year two years from now so you got to look at those things and the board has to own that kind of situation or at least strongly support it quite frankly if we fail we see this across the country on a regular basis there's there's rarely a few weeks that goes by we don't see another hospital closure in the country um, some places worse than others but but really we'll see uh, roughly 10 close every year um, there's 700 hospitals that a study that was done by iVantage recently said that are at risk there are rural hospitals that are at risk of closing they're showing the the metrics that a lot of the hospitals that have closed showed a few years before they close and i'll tell you one of the things we, we fo focus on closures and what hospital closures but my question is is it really death or is it dying is it the act of you know, closed and we can't get it back open or have we been cutting services in a lot of these hospitals for so many years that it's the dying that's causing the problem there was a there was an economic study that was done several years ago on what the impact of the community was when the hospital closed and quite frankly the answer was within a few years there really wasn't much economic change and that's because everybody had quit going to that hospital three or four years before it actually closed everybody had chosen a physician someplace else everyone that could everyone other than the people with a lack of transportation or the folks in the nursing home had gone someplace else so it's it sometimes we get caught up in the these hospitals closed but i wish there was a better metric for morbidity or for for morbidity than it was for mortality it's the dying that's creating a problem that's tough to turn around more than it is the actual death so one thing i'll tell you i've talked about already a lot <laughs> way too much let me tell you please if there's questions in the middle of this stop me if you disagree with what i say you can you can beat the table stand up shake your head or, or stop me and, and let's let's talk through it this stuff is too important for me to just ramble on and, and make a point that's not clear or make something you disagree with so i i, I want to i, I want to give an opportunity if there's any any questions on anything i've had so far i really feel like i'm an auctioneer up here at times sir tim you you talked about the importance of the board Thank you. You, you talked about the importance of the board and you talked about the characteristics of the board member, et cetera, et cetera. But without pointing any fingers or being, um, overstepping my bounds, a lot of times CEOs have boards that have already been appointed and they're working with them. And as a friend of mine once said, the board members come in and say, how long is this going to take? I've got to be somewhere else. How do you change that mentality to what you're describing, which is really a long-term commitment to the health and welfare of that hospital? A lot, of, a lot of what I'll go into is what we do at Margaret Mary, and we are in a, we're 501c3, so we've got a self-appointed board. So I've got the ability to kind of develop good board members. But when I was in Illinois, I was a county hospital, so it was elected appointed type of situation um, and a lot of times they're one issue board members they're, they're simply um, you know my niece wants to get a job at this hospital because she's finishing the nursing program and I want to be on the board uh, so that that can happen and that's really all I'm interested in I was at this hospital three weeks ago and, and or, or three years ago and I it took me an hour to get into the emergency department I really have emergency so that's all I really want to care want to work on that stuff is tough. Um, I, I think it's educating the board on what a good board is, what the impact of not being engaged and not understanding what's happening in healthcare, and the impact of understanding that the board and the CEO aren't going to work together and, and get on the same page. You're going to fail the people that have come before you to put this hospital in place. I don't know that there's any quick fix to that. The education is, is tough to get people to understand the fact that you show up to a meeting and you just want to do one thing, you want to get out, uh, how much damage that causes. Um, I think it's just enlightening that. And I, I think some of that cannot come from the hospital CEO. I mean, you, you, you sit there and, and you give that message and, you, and your time is limited at that point in time. I think it's got to come from other experts and seeing what's happening and, creating a burning platform that if you don't do this, you don't function as a good 
uh, board of directors, this will be the inevitable outcome for your hospital and your community. If you're not willing to do it, let's find some people that are. I don't know who can deliver that. I, I think maybe you know someone uh, from an academic medical center that's got a background in neonatology maybe would be an ideal person to kind of bring that <laughs> message to boards. Um, or, or someone from out of state that can come in and say it and walk out and not be and not have to deal with, with their kids being harassed by the board members' kids in the high school. Um, you know, some of that stuff you, you can't you can't deliver in your home own hometown, but it really needs to be said and we're putting a lot of these rural hospitals in danger if they don't. New Jersey went through this a while back, they had a lot of hospital closures and they found out the boards were completely uninformed and ill, ill prepared to do the job they need to do. When the hospital closes, they'd ask the board members, well, what happened? Well, I don't know. I thought things were fine. And then they looked at the level of engagement the board members had, it was just virtually zero. So they put a law in place, I think the board members have to go through six years of continuing education every two years, or six, six hours of continuing education every two years. It's like, wow, that would be a lot. That would be a tremendous amount. But I think it takes more than that. Um, it's not an easy process. Uh, <coughs> wish I had a good answer for you. Um, characteristics of uh, good board members. I'll just go through some of these basically. I think the slides will be available. But the ability not to dominate, um, articulate an opinion, um, and respect the opinions of others. Showing up on time is always good. Staying for the entire meeting would be always good too. Um, understanding the importance is there. And, and there are people like this in our community. They don't always, they're not necessarily always the ones sitting on the hospital board. Um, but some of them are. Uh, some of them are there for the glory of being on the hospital board. I'm not exactly sure what glory that is, but some of them really think there's something out there. Um, but there are good people that meet these criteria uh, that, that should be on the board. This is probably, this is from my board chairman. Um, and I said, what does it take to be a good board member? And he, he said, this is really the statement from him. He said, you've got to be able to understand complex issues that in a field you have no knowledge about whatsoever. You've got to be able to process this stuff. Um, I don't know how you teach that. I think that is probably an eight. Um, you, you've got to realize you are not the expert in this area, but you've got to be able to, to and you, you've got to hit the CEO hard if they're not explaining it well. If, if you've just brought up a concept none of us understand, you've got to be able to go back to the CEO and say, I don't understand that. You run that one by me again. You explain this in layman's terms. You are harder at your presentation because I've got to be able to understand this to support it fully. I really think this is the best question a board member can ask and it leads to that point. And I don't understand what's going on. Does anybody else feel the same way? And you might be the one lost board member. And if everybody else understands it, then just let it go. But there's your opportunity for another board member to say, yeah, I, I had a problem with this quality report. I don't know exactly whether letting 3% of our patients die that have this condition is a good thing or a bad thing. Can you explain that to me? Um, if, if, if you have advice for your board members at all, encourage them to say that because they don't want to look stupid, but that's a really important question to ask. A couple of things we've done is we've moved away from paper. We, we moved with our board members to iPads. So it was, I never get the report in plenty in enough time. I never get what I need. Every, you know, you drop this information on me 48 hours before the board meeting, expect me to vote on it. It's a multi-million dollar project or something like that. So we've moved to this iPad format that allows the speed and processing of information. The board packets go out. A lot of stuff goes real time. All the pre-reads go. We've got a four-day drop-off. If it's not there before the board meeting four days, then it doesn't get on the board meeting. Um, a lot of stuff like that. We, we went to meaningful dashboards. I do a, our board meets every other month. I do a CEO update letter on the, on key projects. And I'll also put key articles uh, from different things in healthcare, hospital closure issues, changes in Medicare, what MACRA is. I'll put the article in, in this, it all goes out through the, through the iPads, but there's also always a paragraph or two of what this means to our hospital. Not just a macro article or a MIPS article or changes in the marketplace, but what it really means to us so that they have context and that type of thing. We do, 
uh, you guys all have committees that come together. Somebody drops off the board. Well, who do we get? And then the discussion is about, well, I know a guy, you know, or I know somebody that can do. And and and, and I've seen this take place at a board meeting. At, well, we need to get this person. You know, anything I can do, and this this goes to your point. <coughs> Getting good people queued up to be on the board, it's developing a list of prospects and suspects. Um, if you've got people that would be good for the board, having a discussion with them a year or two before they would get on the board, the opportunity comes up to get on the board, and bringing them in to committee meetings or educating on what's happening, so that you say, you ask someone, hey, can you join the hospital board? The meeting is in two weeks, and the meeting's tonight. <laughs> Versus, would you be interested in joining the hospital board in 2019? And over the next couple of years, we'll ramp you up to that. That's tough, that's long-term types of things, but if you've got a list of seven or eight people that you've kind of developed that have a willingness that you can kind of bring into the hospital once every six months or a year, and this is kind of what's going on as sort of leaders in the community, that's beneficial for you before they even get on the board. This development of future board members is probably one of the best things I think you can do to help have it, and, and keep in mind as a CEO, if you start doing this stuff, you'll really help out the person that comes after you. So it, what you'll see in the background, my colleague Nikki King, she was administrative fellow uh, at Margaret Mary a year or so ago, and now as a um, manager of our addiction services, she'll be speaking later as a data analyst. All the work that I'm doing with this is preparing so that she has a board she can deal with in you know, five, 10 years, or whenever she starts running, running the hospital. So. So this is stuff that, that doesn't work out for you well today, but gives you something to look forward to. And then that board member, well, I, I really don't want to leave the board, and I'm, I'm, you know, because you don't have anybody to replace me. Oh, we've got great people here. Don't worry, you know, we're in good shape. You just don't worry about it. You've got needs, you know, we're, we're, so that's something I would recommend. Um, Establish clear goals for your trustees. This this is important, so they start having expectations. And you just have a discussion with your board as a whole, or if you can form a governance committee, that's even better. Um, what what participation is like? What what involvement is? What 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 we can do? There needs to be a discussion about charitable giving as well. Um, sometimes there's an expectation. Uh, many times there's not. Making the statement that there's not an expectation for charitable giving is as important as anything. Um, setting your board meetings up is pretty, making them useful. Getting board member engagement means the board has to be involved in the meeting somehow. They have to find it useful. They can't dread going to the meeting and hearing the reports. But it also can't just be about chatting um, and, and different things like that. So from a board standpoint, how much, the, how much of it is reporting? And how much is a discussion at the board? Well, we can't just get together in a room and talk about stuff without having anything to base it on. And we don't want to just sit up and give statistical reports and show them spreadsheets and charts and things like that. So what's the balance? And I will say one of the things you've got to do is find out what that balance is with your board. How much is about reporting and how much is about discussion? Because if they sit in the meeting room for three hours and hear nothing but reports, they don't feel like they're engaged, they're doing anything, their level of commitment is going to be low. Another thing I'll tell you, and this is, this, I'll, I'll be a, a strong advocate on this, is the board needs to attend educational events together. If you're a board member and you're coming to an educational event and you hear the one thing, the epiphany hits you and says, this is what we have to do as a hospital, the rest of your board's not there, you're going to come back to your board meeting and say this is what we need to do and the rest of the board's going to look like you look at you like you got corn growing out of your ears they just won't get it if you attend a, a meeting together and say hey this is what's going on this is the challenge we're facing and this is what we need to do you can move ahead if you don't do it as a board as a whole you're not going to move ahead um, so we've got a, a process in place for, for ours about um, uh, about what goes on. If you are a county board, city board, district board, community board, and you're public, and all of a sudden everybody's loading up in a car or flying one place or another to go to a board education, is it going to look like a junket to your community or some in your community? Yes, it is. There's just no way around that. Um, uh, driving to Albany, 
may be a junket to people in your community from coming here today. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to fight that, but it's just going to be out there, and you need to be able to have a cohesive message for why you're doing it, what you're getting out of it, and what you learned. Because you're going to have to, you're going to face that scrutiny, and you better be ready for it. But you shouldn't let the scrutiny stop you from doing what's right. One thing that we did is regional education sessions. There are national meetings. You can go to D.C., you can go to Phoenix, you can go to Florida, um, and, and the board can go as a whole. What we did at our hospital and really focused on is put our own meeting together. And we did it, we've done it at our tertiary facilities. I can tell you we did it at a medical school once. We did it at tertiary facilities in Indianapolis and Cincinnati that we refer patients to. And, and it's me going to the CEO of that facility saying, why should we send our patients to you? What are you good at? What are you doing better than anybody else? What happens to our patients? And then I put my board in front of them. My board here is from the tertiary facility. My board here is from the medical school. Why are you guys a good partner with us? And then they see us as, I differentiate my hospital from every other small community hospital out there. Because my board's talking about long-term things, talking about what we can do together, how that organization can invest in us. Um, I can tell you they're also cheap to put on. You're typically driving, you have one night in a hotel. Uh, I don't even have to pay for a conference room because I get it at, at, at the hospital that I go to. I have speakers come in from the State Hospital Association, the American Hospital Association. I prep them all on the specifics of our organization and the challenges we're facing. They may know our financials, they, they all know our strategic plan. Um, and, and those presentations are not like what you're hearing this morning, which is a general what should all boards do. It is specific to my organization. Someone comes in and says, this is what's happening. You've got a six-member board. They're appointed by the county. This is what goes on. This is what you need to do to be successful. If you're not doing this, this, and this, you're going to fail. If you start doing this, this, and this, you've got a better chance of succeeding. And it's, 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 it's directed to my hospital. The board has a lot of input on what they want to hear and what they need to hear. But from that, we've done a lot of things. I will tell you, our strong, a long-range planning comes from that. One of the biggest things that came out of it was our move to an accountable care organization of population health. And it came down to one presentation that somebody from the State Hospital Association did, because we were very confused on where to, where to go with population health. ACOs, you have to have 5,000 patients. We only got 6,000 people in our, in our town. How are we going to get 5,000 Medicare patients assigned to us? We thought we'd let the academic medical centers figure this out, and then we, we, we jump on the bandwagon once it, it got figured out. But the presentation was made, and this guy came up and said, look, population health is about my grandma. And when I was little, I used to play with my grandma, and I loved being there with her. And one day I go and she's in a wheelchair because she had diabetes. And it got so bad they had to cut off her toe. Now I have no idea why they had to cut off her toe at that time, but I know my grandma couldn't play with me. Next time I visit my grandma, she's in bed because they had to cut off her leg because her diabetes got worse. So the next time I visited was her funeral. But all along the way, the hospital and the doctors got paid to diagnose the disease, got paid to cut off the toe, got paid to cut off the leg, but nobody was ever incentivized to keep my grandmother's diabetes under control. And at that moment in time, my board turns to me in unison and looks at me and says, we've got to be part of this. Our people and our community deserve better than what we're doing right now. So we've got to figure out how to be in this population health and keep people's diabetes under control, not just focus on fee-for-service where we get paid to do stuff to people. That became a strategic initiative within 30 seconds. And it happened because the whole board was there and they heard three or four presentations culminating in this one. So we changed our strategic plan at that point in time. And this is one of the things I think we're so good at at small community hospitals. We can turn like a ski boat and not a cruise ship. We can turn this thing on a dime. We can engage the medical staff. I had two members of the medical staff that were there at that presentation. They took the message back to the medical staff. We're gonna take a flyer on this. We're gonna, we partnered with hospitals in Michigan, the rest of Indiana and California, and formed a rural accountable care organization. 
That was several years ago, and now if you saw this map, it would fill up the entire country. Because a lot of rural hospitals have jumped on board of this and have, have done this. Um, but it, I will tell you, our involvement went down to that presentation with the board of directors. The next one that was a, a big initiative that, that came on was a partnership with Marion University, an osteopathic medical school in Indiana. Indiana's only had one medical school in the history of the state, Indiana University, largest medical school in the country. But there was no variation on that. Marion University started a medical school and they asked us to be a partnership. The problem was, if they started a medical school, it would be two to three years before they had their first student seven years before they graduated anyone, and 10 years before anybody finished residency. So this is a long-term commitment. So they wanted the financial support from us. They wanted guarantees that their students could rotate at our hospital. The board heard this in a regional presentation that we had actually at Marion University. And, and their statement was, well, we still need good doctors in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and do this. And that was a long-range vision of the board that I, I wouldn't have necessarily had as a CEO. I will tell you that Marion University last year just graduated their first medical, medical, medical students, and we've already got eyes on two students that are in residency programs right now. And they've been rotating through our hospital for a long time. It changed the mindset from us where you know, we consider ourselves a teaching institution now. Uh, people are excited about being in rural rotations. They're not fifth in line behind the fellow and the resident and the fourth year medical student. They're first in line standing shoulder to shoulder with our primary care physicians, learning how to practice medicine in the small community and loving it and wanting to come out. So they're not only get, getting a chance of moving that agrarian situation, but they're really standing and uh, getting excited about practicing in our community and looking forward to coming back to our community and they're trained to be able to practice successfully in our community. So this is something that, that came from that regional session. These are two big examples of what happened that wouldn't have happened had we not, had we just gone on uh, with the regular thing. I've got a couple of questions. Um, should the board get involved? These are kind of things. We've got board members, what you should get involved in, the complaints about the ER wait time. Um, should the board get involved in that? Yes or no? My vote is no. Pass it on. Let it, let people know if you shouldn't get involved. But that's a micromanagement piece. Um, staff member tells you that you're not getting the real story from administration. Okay, keep your nose out of this one too. This one's micromanagement. That will always happen. That's what's going on. Um, you want to find out what you can put in place to make sure you get the real story, but don't go accusing the chief nursing officer or chief hospital. Uh, administration people that uh, of what's going on that that does not lead to a, a good end um, a friend tells you they have chest pain and shortness of breath should the board member get involved okay yes <laughs> that's a 911 call so don't 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 hesitate um, state senator calls uh, and wants to know uh, about how ACA is affecting you yes you want to get involved you probably that's a call to the hospital administrator and a call probably to somebody in the georgia hospital association to find out what this senator's background would be really want to know and what you should be telling them um, but board members voices carry a tremendous amount uh, lots of things i won't go into these too much but there are, there will always be um, issues of conflict of interest it's just kind of what happens um, just declare the conflict and realize in a small town there's always going to be conflict. Um, yeah, you know, the board, some people relate, if you're in a real small town, I will tell you Batesville is a real small town. There's, there's a dozen families that encompass about half the population. So if you don't have your board related to somebody in leadership in the hospital, or a couple of people employed there, you don't have the right people on your board. Um, it's going to be, but declare the conflict and just go on. So, um, board members' job, I, I do think their job is vital. I, I think we've got to convince them that their job is vital. Maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago when healthcare was easy, they could mail it in. They could just show up and have their name on the list, and it's just not that way today. To be a successful community hospital, you've got to have them engaged, and, and the people 
that set the organization up um, deserve that. They have a lot of vision to make sure there was a hospital in your community and you don't want to, see, your board members should not let it die on their watch. Um, last thing I kind of want to talk about a little bit, we've got all the days so we can get into any number of these things, well, almost the last thing I'm talking about, is, is what the visions for rural healthcare are. Um, a few organizations have come out with what the future of rural health care is supposed to be. And I want to share those kind of with you. The first one is the National Rural Health Association. They've got a future of rural health care paper. To be successful, what they're advocating for is increased collaborations between the federal qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and hospitals. The creation of a critical outpatient hospital. This is specific legislation that they're advocating for and the American Hospital Association supports it, that you take a critical access hospital that really has 25 beds right now and is struggling because their inpatient census is one, two, three, or four, and turning it into an outpatient only hospital. So it has 24-7 outpatient care, or 24-7 emergency care, outpatient care, probably some population health component where they're responsible for the health of the population. Um, could have surgery, would definitely have a few observation beds, but paid under a different mindset that you're not keeping the full inpatient unit open. Um, they think that's a sustainable. Um, it improves community school-based opportunities, working with big work with school corporations a big deal, um, and create op options for downstream savings. What that means is if your hospital is really involved in population health and you want to prevent colon cancer then you get real active on screenings. You get real active on colonoscopies. You get real active on trying to prevent this kind of stuff. And there's a benefit to you when you reduce that, when you improve the health of your population, you reduce the number of cardiac surgeries, cath procedures, um, downstream cancer procedures, or, or things from a prenatal care standpoint. Um, the American Hospital Association has a vulnerable communities report that came out uh, about nine months ago. Um, they are advocating um, looking at rural hospitals and, under, and inner city urban together. So it's a vulnerable communities report. That's kind of how they look at see a lot of the same things. Uh, again, clinic and, and rural hospital collaboration. Their delivery model options are pretty much like the uh, critical outpatient hospital. Their global payment is a, sort of a, a what, what is going on in Maryland. You're paid a fixed amount to take care of these people. That's what you get. And you can spend that on behavioral health, you can spend that on social determinants, you can spend it on housing, but this is what you get. And how that global payment works is really interesting. It may work well in a rural environment. Uh, the folks in Maryland seem to like it. Uh, they're spending more on social needs than, than actual acute care and things like that. So that's what AHA is advocating for. Uh, and then there's the strategies to improve rural health care that, that's out there also. It focuses a lot on telemedicine, um, a lot on public health, and a lot on telemedicine. And the links are, are earlier in the slide, yeah, you can see where those are. Um, I'm a big advocate for telemedicine, but there's a lot of, um, telemedicine is almost a pronoun, because when I say that, everybody's thinking something different. I think they've got their, their different uh, capabilities. Is the physician's office in the future going to be a, medical assistant with a kiosk and, and five different physicians on video that they can draw if they need to in some small areas. Um, what is What are different applications? Medical College of Georgia, um, clearly uh, one of the leaders in telemedicine with stroke care across the country. And, and I don't have to tell, talk to you guys about that, mm -hmm. but, but it's been proven successful in a lot of different situations. So it's how we apply it that's going to be tricky. Um, obviously, everybody's got an opinion on rural health care. Um, what MedPAC, MedPAC wants to turn hospitals into clinics with an ambulance. As long as you've got a clinic and an ambulance standing by, you should be okay. Um, I will tell you that the help for rural health care is not going to come in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's going to be in the United States Senate. 98 senators believe they're from a rural state. That's what we want. We want them all to believe they're from a rural state. That's where the battle's going to be fought. That's where we have the biggest opportunities. The House of Representatives, 80% of the population lives in an urban area, and that's who the House of Representatives supports and represents. And they're not bad people, but they're not 
represent the voice of rural. The Senate, I really think, is the only chance we've got. So. Um, questions? Let's see, I've got a couple other things to talk about next. Any questions I, you guys have on anything? I went way past my time, and I apologize. Good. Yeah. These we can we can bring up others at another time with different opportunities that get put on that we can discuss throughout the day. Is there any handbook for board members that talks about expectations and educates them about the things they need to know? Is any national organization doing that? Yeah, um, we just we just partnered. The American Hospital Association used to have a Center for Healthcare Governance that they closed down last year. Um, just not enough hospitals were being part of it. Um, uh, we used to work with them at a company called Gallagher Associates. It was the one that we worked with mostly recently. They developed, and I think it's available at no charge, kind of a handbook for community hospital board members. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to get that resource to you, but but. Um, but there's a specific, and they're, they're the ones that I, that I recommend uh, the most. And it, but basically, it's how do you handle this conflict of interest deal? What are some sample bylaws that you really need? Um, what are, how to deal with some of the changes in healthcare? And, and what it was is a friend of mine that, that recently retired, he was a kind of a, a consultant for different small community hospitals. It was really his passion to keep these hospital boards thriving. And on his way out, he kind of wrote this guide for rural hospital boards and he I think he worked with the National Rural Health Association to make it available free. Um, Gallagher and Associates is the company that he kind of sold his company to and they produce it and their, their goal is to kind of get to you to use them as a consultant but I think that resource is free and I'll, I'll, I'll find that and get that to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was just going to add to that also um, I believe it's the Iowa Health Association they require boards to um, they require, require boards to have training. So if you go online on their site, they have some good resources um, for board training and board a like bad book. Okay, great. I, I know it's coming up as a theme, rightly because when, when CMS looks at a closure of a hospital, what will it really went on? And, and I would tell you. When you interview people in the town, it's like the administration, oh, we didn't like the CEO. He wasn't from around here anyway, and we don't think he did a good job. And that was really what happened. But it's really tough to get the answer, but when they dive in deeply, it really ends up being how engaged was the board was one of the key answers. If we weren't engaged very well, then that ends up being a problem. So I think it's, it's spurred a lot of these states to sort of look at one thing we can do to stop closures is require this of boards, or at least make it easier for them. Tim, a potential strategy for developing board members. Most boards have committees, and the committees usually are populated just with members of the board. What about bringing other people from the community in to serve on those boards, and in that way begin the process of educating them with health care, and also seeing which ones would, in fact, would, in, would be effective board members? I think that's a great concept. If, if your bylaws allow it, or you can modify your bylaws to allow it, turning your finance committee into a more robust committee, allowing other people to come in. A lot of the times the board's really reluctant to do that because they lose control. Um, I, I'm never, it, it, it's rare how important the boards think they are. It, 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 I mean, my board, we're actually flying to a conference um, and one of the board members is like, we can't have all the board on the same, on the plane at the same time. I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> I won't go into the flight safety issue, but, but if you guys went down, we'd be okay. <laughs> we'd still take care of patients. We'd spend a few months developing a new board of directors, but it's all right. But, but sometimes it's like, oh, we talk about really sensitive things. You know, my thing is let good leaders in the community know what we're doing. And hospitals seem to fail by the community think they're doing things that are secretive much more than they do by bringing people in and letting secrets out. Um, I, I really think the more people we can have on these committees, if your committee's 10 people, and there are 10 people in the, in the community that know what the hospital's facing and know what the hospital's trying to do, or impressed with what we're trying to do, that, that helps us a lot. It's not that they go to the coffee shop and spread the secrets <coughs> and say, hey, you know, I was on the committee, um, 
meeting at the hospital the other day, they're facing some tough issues, but they've got some really good people, and, and I'm glad I'm part of making it successful. The more that that happens in the community, the better I think you're going to be. And I think having five people on a small community board and nobody knows what's going on in the hospital is really a bad thing. The, the example I've got is, now, this, you might think this is rural, you might think it you might not think it is, but Martha's <coughs> Vineyard is, a, is one of the critical access hospitals we look to. Real challenges in Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. An island, so they've got to be it for their community. There's, there's helicopter flights, which sometimes you can fly, sometimes you can't. They've got to be able to provide for that community the way they need to. And, and they just fired the CEO. And the board fired the CEO, and there's a lot of noise in the community and stuff like that. But the community's upset because they don't know what's going on in their local hospital. And that seems to be the theme more than anything else. They don't understand what's happening. The more people you can bring inside the family, and tell them what's going on, what we're doing, what we're looking forward to, I think the better off you're going to be. All right. We can talk about these things as the day goes on, different things like that. But guys, I appreciate your time. Sorry for running. Jim, you're not, not over at all. Oh. We still have a couple of minutes. We, got oh, well, okay. yeah. we can talk to that. Amy's, um, on, Amy's on deck at 10. But go right in. I'll just comment on that last piece. I served as a board member when I was in, in uh, Fort Hill. And I know this doesn't happen in other small communities, but people in the community would make stuff up if they didn't hear stuff from, from you know, it would leak out from a board member and they'd just make stuff up. So the yeah. more you go ahead and let it out, let the oh, truth out, the better. I love rumors and propaganda. I love that, you know. <laughs> tell me what's going on. Tell me what people are hearing in the community. Because you're right, they will make stuff up because there's got to be news about the hospital. And it really has. And I, I think some of this stuff happened, the communities were used to hearing a lot, they were used to hearing, I mean, before HIPAA, you know, every church would have their prayer chain out there. You know who was in the hospital. You know, you know what was going on. I mean, and all of a sudden, everybody went quiet on us. You, you just can't hear any good stuff out of the hospital anymore. So there must be bad things happening. There must be secret. Um, and it's tough, I'll tell you, from a, from a hospital administrator standpoint, I mean, some of us grow up in town, but most of us don't. Um, you come in, you're an outsider. Uh, there's a lack of trust to begin with uh, at, at times. Then, then you, you know, then heaven forbid you have to fire somebody. Well, I know so and so, and she's a real good person. I don't know what they're they're firing them for. And you can't tell them. I mean, you, you really want to get in touch with somebody. You fire their you fire your daughter's Sunday school teacher, and it, it makes it tough to walk into the grocery store in town. At times. So, worst I had the Walmart reader. I had to fire her daughter. I'm walking into Walmart and got my kids, and everybody gets a little happy sticker and everything except my kids. <laughs> and I don't know that they actually felt safe at that point in time. Tough stuff happened. The more people you've got supporting you, the more people you've got to realize you're not the devil. It really, it, it's, it's about the only chance you've got. And some of the stuff's going to be tough no matter what. A couple things that are opportunities for you guys. One of the things that, that I wanted to talk about today is solutions. And um, 340B program, if you're not involved with this, I, I highly suggest we, we can go into this in detail if you'd like. But the drug pro discount drug program, a lot of the rural hospitals call for that. Uh, swing beds, if you're a critical access hospital, very successful program. Definitely doesn't make money, but breaks even, allows you to contain, keep your keep your qualified staff in the inpatient unit. Philanthropy is always a great thing in the small community if you can get it. Um, this stuff has to be developed over time, but if you can find anybody that doesn't have kids and has a big farm, that's always a good center. That's always a good thing. Um, there's not a lot of money, I mean, so it's not like there's this big philanthropy opportunity, but if you can get it, it, it it's, it's worth it. And I think through philanthropy, it's the ability to tell our story to the community in a way that we can. So, so empowered foundations and things like that can really be successful. Uh, I, the population health thing with the accountable care organization, Nikki's going to get into some detail uh, about that much later, but, but what you get out of that is a lot of data about set of patients that you never had any idea about and then you actually end up increasing their use of your facility because they were going everywhere and now 
you're looking to prove their health, so they're getting their screenings at your place. They're, I mean, it, it really is about not the savings itself, it's really more about capturing that patient population. Uh, Work-based clinics, a lot of employers are really getting into that, what you can do to provide care at their facility, because their story is, hey, when I have anybody that goes to the doctor's office, I lose them for the whole day, or they can't get in that day, and I lose them for the next day. So they're looking at putting facilities at their at their location. Um, and it's better for you to do it than have somebody else come in. So, um, there's a lot that can be done with critical access hospitals and utilizing a space. If you're a critical access hospital and you've got a cafeteria, you might want to rethink that because you're losing a ton of money on it. If you've got a gift shop, you definitely want to get that out of there. There's a lot of different things you can do to increase your reimbursement for Medicaid, uh, Medicare if you, if you go about that specifically. Now, if you want to create a war with your volunteers or your auxiliary, go ahead and cut the gift shop out. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so I'll just warn you before you do that. <laughs> um, weird government funding programs that are out there. Um, the best advice I ever got on this is when, when I started as a hospital CEO, I had three farmers on my board of directors. And the best advice they gave me is they said, there are some weird government programs out there. That I've got, I've got hilltop land that they think is somehow wetlands, and they're paying me not to grow corn on this hilltop land. And by golly, I am not growing corn on that hilltop. So you have got to adapt. The people that stayed with farming and didn't adapt to the weird government programs quit farming in the 80s. You've got to adapt no matter how this is absolutely senseless. It doesn't make a bit of, bit of difference. If it doesn't harm your patients and helps your hospital continue going on, adapt to the weird government programs. It's just the way it is. And understanding that's a big deal. Um, I'm big on, I, I get into medical schools, I'm big on moving us to agrarian. Getting your next generation of, of physicians, nurses, therapists, technicians uh, from your local high schools and creating that partnership with them. The more high school students I can go, I can get to come home and say, I went to Margaret Mary and had a great experience for their parents, the more I ingrain my hospital to the local community. The more of that that happens, the better. So there's several wins on that, investing in high school students and getting people. We've got one of the programs I love is, is our transport program. So if you're a third year undergrad or going into medical school or first year medical school, you get employed in our hospital as a transporter. So you're moving people around. So you get a chance to interact with patients without sticking them with anything and giving them any bad news. Um, you learn all about the hospital and I get those bright students more that are local that are there. Instead of working at McDonald's or someplace else for the summer, they work at my hospital. Uh, and they get more engaged and then they go back and I hear a lot from their parents um, how wonderful that is and it's like that's great you want him back here anything you can do to get her back and work in our hospital is good but in the meantime we're creating so much goodwill um, for the benefits so um, that's what I have to share on those issues we'd like to talk about those or any more anything else as we go throughout the day any other questions yes thank you very much I would be around.